Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, week 4 of the faith that works. Um, we'll pick it up at verse 27. Stan, would you please uh, the reading of God's holy word. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 9, picking it up at verse 27. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and he asked, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, will it be done for you? And their sight was restored. I love the King James. And their eyes were open. Jesus warned them sternly, see that no one knows about this. But they went out and they spread the news about him all over the region. Father God, thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you so much for our King who, who lords, authors, and perfects his faith in our hearts and in our lives. That we may serve you and that we may please you and that, that we may move, Lord, in you. Lord, I just ask right now that you will do, that, that the eyes of our heart by faith will now just be opened by you. That we can behold your greatness as revealed in your holy scriptures, Lord. Help us to embrace the real you, Jesus, from our heart of faith. For Lord, when, when, when we embrace your greatness, you do great things. Hallelujah. And we love you and we bless you for that. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn around and say, let the eyes of your heart be open. Would you please go ahead? Now, as we've been talking about this for the last uh, several weeks, God's Word shows us that the faith that really works in our lives comes solely from Jesus Christ. Amen. As the Bible says, and let's read this again, shall we? Hebrews 2, I'm sorry, 12, the first, first part of verse 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Now, the reason why I'm talking about the faith that Jesus authors is because there is a human faith. There is a kind of faith out there that, that is peddled, and there's a kind of faith out there. And, and you wonder, well, what in the world do you mean by human faith? How many of you went to high school? How many of you had cheerleaders? And how many of those cheerleaders were trying to pump faith into the audience and into the, right? Yeah. Human faith. Human faith. I'm not saying it's bad, but it's not the same thing as divine faith. Yeah. How many of you watched info commercials before? Any of you ever watch infomercials on TV? And any of you ever seen those, those shows? Come, you could get rich fast or come and, and create wealth. We will create wealth. And when you go to those places, what will happen? And, and, uh, and I'll say this because there's young people here and you need to hear me say this. What will happen is, is that you'll go and the first thing that will happen is they'll give kind of a, a slight introduction, but they'll have, they'll jam pack that place full of people who says, I bought into this thing and boy, I'm making 20 million. I bought into this thing and I sold my fifth house. I bought into this thing and I... You know, and, and, they'll, and they'll fill it full of people. See, there's something about the human nature that we want to believe something. Now, usually what, the, what they'll do is they'll say something to the effect of, you know, just think what you can do for your family if you, if you create it well. See, and well, the reason why they're doing that is they're trying to create a, because there's a hurdle saying, this feels selfish. So if they say, but if you could do it for your family, they created, a, they, they, they created a little bridge over that little hurdle, right? Oh, just think what you could do for your family if you made a million dollars. Well, I called my kids up and say, nothing, it's mine. No, no, no. <laughs> but, I mean, but, you know, we feel that way. And, and, and so they say that. And so then, but this is what they do. Then they get you in there and you're buying it because there's something in human nature wants to believe. We want to believe it. 
we do. And so we start listening and it makes us that much more excited and that much more and that much more. And what they're going to do then is they're going to present this program and this program with these videos. This is regularly $5,000, but because we've got the okay from, from the national office, you're here today and we can offer this to you for $1,000, but only today. And we're going, I'm already saving $4,000. <laughs> right? And they sell you something that actually costs them less than $5 to manufacture. That brings really no guarantees at all. That's human faith. Human faith will always be based on emotions. The faith that Jesus authors will always be based on God's word and spiritual conviction. And, and, and some of you need to start saying, praise God. Because quite frankly, there's times when every Christian wakes up in the morning and if, if our faith depended on our emotions, we're all going to hell. You know what I mean? has nothing to do with how you feel. has everything to do with who Jesus is and the conviction that only he gives in our hearts that it is true. That's his faith. He develops it in us. He authors it in us. He perfects it in us. And, and there's something about what we're going to discover today is that the faith that Jesus authors in us is a faith that enables us to embrace the greatness of Jesus and, and, and respond to him accordingly. And brothers and sisters, I want to let you know, when we embrace his greatness, we make room for his great things to happen. For according to your faith, well, it be done unto you. Amen? Amen? So let's pick it up at verse 27. Read it with me, would you please? As Jesus went from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. Now, the there that, that Matthew is talking about is Jesus had just finished um, rising Jairus' little dead daughter, um, up and and you know you, you remember the story Jairus comes to Jesus says my daughter is ill she's about to die Jesus says I will come with you on the way the woman with the issue of blood presses through touches the hem of his garment he stops he speaks to her in her faith and he deals with her and we looked at that that event in Jesus's life and and then Jesus went on and the people came and and told do not bother the master anymore your daughter is dead and Jesus turned around and said do not fear only believe only believe and he went there and there was already the professional mourners were already out there and and Jesus said that this this girl is not dead she's asleep and they all laughed at him so he made them all leave brought some of his disciples in and brought the parents in and he said to the little girl this is Tim Moen translation but this is pretty darn pretty darn accurate honey little girl I say wake up took her by the hand and she woke. she came back to life and he restored her and it was just then when Jesus went out from there. Two blind men followed him, calling out, have mercy on us, son of David. Now the Bible doesn't tell us how these men connected with the truth about Jesus to receive the faith that they had that only Jesus can author. It just demonstrates the fact that they already had it. And, and we see this by their actions. Again, as James says, you know, faith without works or faith without its corresponding action is dead. You could say you believe something all day long, but if it's not moving you to act accordingly. You could say Jesus is the Savior, but if you're not trusting him, it's not doing you anything. It's not real faith. You could say Jesus is Lord, but if you're not bowing your knee to his lordship and letting him be the boss and the master of your life, really, and obeying his word, really, you don't have faith. I don't care what you say. 
You can say Jesus is God, but if you're not bowing your knee and you're, wor you're not worshiping him, if there is not an action that corresponds to what you say you believe, that, that, that's, it's dead. It's not true. But these men had an action that corresponded. First, the first thing they did was what? They followed Jesus. They followed Jesus. The next thing they do, the next thing they do is they cry out for mercy. Once again, recognizing the greatness of his benevolent authority. Again, you know, let, let me just share with you. Every time in the New Testament when someone came to Jesus on the basis of his mercy, he never turned them away, but he always responded. Why is that so important? Because the Bible, God says in the Old Testament, and then it's, it's re-recorded in the book of Romans, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and we go, great. That means maybe it's a hit or miss for me. No, no, keep reading because, because at the end of that 11th chapter of Romans, it says God has bound all men over to disobedience. Get this, that he might have mercy on them all. Amen. Amen. Wow. Wow. You see, the, 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 the thing is, is unless our eyes are open to the fact that, number one, we offended the one whom we need mercy for, there's no coming to him on the basis of mercy. And unless our eyes are open to the fact that only he can alleviate the things our sin has caused, we'll never come to him for mercy. See, the power and the light of God's glory not only needs to shine on Jesus. And listen, there's people out there who call themselves Christians, and they say, I believe who Jesus is, but really in their hearts, they never believed that they really needed a Savior. That's kind of like an official thing in order to get right. They have not had the, uh, the light of the Lord shine on, on the, the crud of their hearts. They haven't seen the fact that they are a monster of iniquity like all of us are. They haven't seen the fact that, that in their heart they were dead and opposed and rebellious, shaking their fist at the living true God. And unless God's light from his word comes in our heart and we see that, we'll never ask for mercy. Oh, and that's the beginning of repentance. And tell me, is there a salvation without repentance? No. Absolutely not. That's why he wrote, by grace he taught my heart to fear. Amen. And grace my fears relieved. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. This is just the truth. And here, these men's hearts were already opened by the faith that Jesus gives. Enough to know they have to cry out to him for mercy. And then they call him something else. What do they call him? Son of David. Proclaiming Jesus to be God's promised Jewish Messiah, whose throne would be established forever, according to 2 Samuel 7. What's unique about this is that these blind men were the first in Jesus' ministry to ever publicly acknowledge a belief that Jesus is the son of David. How did they know that? How could they see that? Considering their spiritual condition, this embrace of faith is nothing short of a miracle. Again, I want you to consider, first of all, these were Jewish men. And as Jewish men, the Bible says that they were blind, right? Well, the reason why they were blind is because they were under a covenant curse. All of the house of Israel under the Old Testament was. You remember they walked into a covenant, a holy covenant with God, based on their performance and based on their obedience. Oh, that's, not our, that's not where we're at. That's not how we live. But that's how they lived then. They lived based on that old 
that old covenant. And that old covenant, in that old covenant, God said, if you obey me, I will. And he gives this long list in the first part of Deuteronomy 28, all the things. You will not be diseased. You will be this. You'll be that. But then he says, but if you break a law, if you disobey me, if you break my covenant, then God gives this long list of things that will happen to them. And, and one of them, and in fact, we find in that list in Deuteronomy 28, 28. Read it with me, would you? It says, the Lord will afflict you with madness, blindness, and confusion of mind. Now, now, I want you to stop there and see that. When, when it says the Lord, and it's in capitals in your Old Testament, that's Yahweh. Jehovah, the personal name of God. Amen. Who is it afflicting them? Does it say the devil? Who is it? The Lord. The Lord. You know why I say that? Because there is a well-meaning but a very, very wrong teaching going around in a lot of spirit-filled churches that says only the devil afflicts people. Ooh. Seriously. And the problem with that, as much as we would like that, and that would make our theology a little more comfortable, when I read my Bible, My Bible says, the Holy Bible. Do you notice it doesn't say the Holy Smorgasbord? My Bible does not give an option for what we can pick or choose concerning the revelation of God. Once I begin to pick and choose what I want to believe about God or don't want to believe about God, I am no longer believing God of the Bible. I have created an image. And I've blasphemed him. That's important. There's no options. We bow our knee to how God has revealed himself. Would you say amen? Amen. amen. These men were physically blind because they were under a covenant curse. But not only that, these men were also once spiritually blinded by Satan because like me and like you, they were dead in their transgressions and sins. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 4.4. Read it with me, would you please? The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Folks, the unsaved out there doesn't see it. They don't get it. They can't. Satan has blinded their eyes. It says in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, they consider it foolishness. It says in Colossians chapter 1, they consider God. They consider God their enemy. It says in Ephesians chapter 2 and also in 1 John chapter 5 that they were under the control of the evil one. And so we look at this revelation and we say, then who can ever be saved? That's why salvation is the greatest miracle. We cannot talk a person out of their spiritual blindness. We can't lecture them out of it. We can't plead them out of it. It is only by the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Only God can do it. Amen? And here we see these guys' eyes are open. According to 2 Corinthians 4, 6, look at what it says. Read it with me. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But these blind men were only around one who is God but came in the flesh and one who was the humble servant. It says in Isaiah 52, there was nothing about Jesus to attract us to him. 
nothing about his beauty that we should want him. In other words, in the Hebrew, it was saying, I, I know that you'll hate this. We love our little picture of Jesus knocking on the door, and we love the traditional pictures of Jesus. But, but quite frankly, in the Hebrew, if you were to see the real Jesus, if you believe um, Isaiah chapter 52, the real Jesus was kind of physically ugly. And already you hate that. There's nothing about him that would attract us. There's nothing about him. We, he was despised and rejected. And this was before they whooped the soup out of him to be our redeemer. So how in the world can they be around this, this humble servant who come to do God's will, fully God, but fully man? How can they see? They're blind. How can they know this greatness? It was a miracle working of the faith that Jesus gives to open the eyes of their heart. Amen. Wow. So look what happens. Read verse 28 with me. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and he asked them, Do you believe I am able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Now, when, when Jesus asked if they believed he was able to do this, he wasn't asking if they thought that he were merely some guy that had some sort of special gift. We know that because of how they responded. What did they say to the Lord? Yes, Lord. Yes, Yahweh. Yes, Jehovah. Yes, Lord. You see, they understood that Jesus was talking about his ability according to the context of God's holy word concerning the only one who can open blind eyes. They understood that this is the one whom they are before right now was the very same one that Moses was before in the burning bush. For real, see, when Jesus was saying, do you believe you? He was saying, he was asking if they believe he was able because he's the sovereign creator who made them blind. Read, read Exodus 4.11 with me. This is, this is when he was talking through the burning bush to Moses. The Lord said to him, who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? And they were saying, yes, Lord, you are able. They're saying, yes, you are the one who created. You are the one who created all things. You are the one who knitted me in my mother's womb. And you are the one in your sovereign will and for your sovereign purposes chose that I would be blind. See, some of you think that, well, God, God doesn't afflict. He only did that in the Old Covenant. And, and when the Lord was saying that in Deuteronomy 28, he was speaking covenant terms. But when he was saying this to Moses in the burning bush, there was not a covenant yet. There was only the covenant of Abraham. And he was revealing himself this way. And you and I need to have holy reverence fear for the Lord who says, God, you are great. I'm not saying all afflictions come from God. I'm not saying that at all. For there was a woman bent for seven years by a spirit of infirmity, the Bible says. And Jesus set her free. But what I am saying is, is that we better have a biblical reference point of who God is. Amen. And not somebody's book. Right. Amen. Amen. Amen? Okay. He was asking if they believed he was able because he is Jehovah God who alone can open the up the eyes of the blind. Look at what, look what God says in Psalm 146, the first part of verse 8. Read it with me. The Lord gives sight to the blind. Are you, do you believe I am able? You're saying, you're calling me son of David. Are you owning me according to scripture with who the son of David is? Are you saying that I am the Lord? I am Jehovah Yahweh, the creator who has determined this in my sovereignty of who you're going to be. Have, are you saying that I am that same Jehovah, the, the same Yahweh that, can, uh, that alone can open blind eyes? See, he was asking this if they believe that he was because he was Elohim 
who comes to save. Oh, read Isaiah 35 verses 4 and the first part of 5 with me. Read it with me. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be open. The first two references referred to God's personal proper name, Yahweh, Jehovah. Now he's saying, do you believe that I am this Elohim? And I, am I able because I am Elohim? That's the word God there, Elohim. That's the same word that's used in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Now listen to this. This is important that you get this. Elohim. El is one. Elas is two. Elohim is three. Hear, O Israel, the Lord Jehovah our three is one. He's saying, do you believe that I am that one from creation? See, we read in Colossians 1, do we not? For by him all things were created, things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible. They were created by him and for him. And he's saying, do you, are you saying, I am able because I am the one. I am the one before Moses in the burning bush. I am the one the psalmist proclaimed. I am the one who spoke through the prophet Isaiah. I am the one of the three. Elohim. The triune God. And what do they respond? Yes, Lord. You see, the faith that Jesus authors in us is a faith that enlarges our hearts to accept and embrace the greatness of the revelation of who Jesus is. And when we do, there is now room made for him to do great things in us. I'll never forget. I'll never forget when I was a young lad. Oh, I believed in Jesus and he was my savior and, and I believed with Sunday school that, that, you know, he was God. I didn't understand it. I didn't understand the Trinity, you know, well, who does? But I didn't understand it. But I'll never forget reading the book of Hebrews as a young person on my couch and reading that first chapter that proclaims his deity and I stopped and my heart, something just happened and it was just like this big giant boom inside of me and I said you really are God see the teachers gave me the right information Jesus gave me the right impartation Amen. the teachers gave me the right information the Holy Spirit gave me the right revelation right information is here it gets me looking in the right way but only God can impart only God can reveal and the eyes of my faith in fact I remember sitting there going that means that you weren't just a man on the cross that was God on the cross and if that was God on the cross that must mean the power of the cross is a divine power. And because God is eternal, the power of the cross is eternal. And it's immutable. And it's forever. And nothing, nothing, nothing can extinguish the work of the cross. Because it was God on the cross. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. How did that happen? Not because you figure out the math. Revelation. The eyes of our heart become open by the God of faith. So, so look what Jesus did. Verse 29, the first part of verse 30. Read it with me. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith will it be done to you. And their sight was restored. Notice again their faith itself did not bring the healing. We do not believe in divine, I mean, we do not believe in faith healing. We do believe in divine healing. Amen. 
They had the faith, but unless Jesus spoke and unless Jesus reached out and touched, their eyes would still have been blind. Would you hear that? They had the faith, but unless Jesus spoke and unless Jesus reached out and touched, their eyes would have still blind. The reason why I say that is because a lot of people, we, we mistake. We, what we do is we get the faith but we don't get the voice and we don't get the touch, but we start acting on the faith without the voice and without the touch. And then, we, 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 then it doesn't work and then we think we, our faith failed or we think God has failed. We're all along, it has nothing to do with your faith. You believe the right things about him. You believe he's God, you believe he can, you believe he's, he loves, you believe, but what you've done is you, you, you were presumptuous. You are presumptuous. The Bible says that's a sin. Once you come to the place of believing, you still have to go before him. You still have to have personal encounter with him. He still needs to speak and touch. Amen. And then watch the miracle happen. I shared this with you before. Those of you who read Paul um, Youngie Cho's book, The Fifth Dimension, talks about in his book about those young people who were from his church, young workers from his church. They had to go to a summer camp. And that monsoon hit, and it, it had flooded the rivers, and the, and the, and, and, and the um, bridge was washed out. And they, they had to get to the camp, but they couldn't. So they were there. Here were these young workers saying, isn't Peter's God our God? Yes. And isn't Peter's faith our faith? Yes. And didn't Peter walk on water? Yes. So they went out, and they went out in that raging river, and it washed them, and they drowned. And the big newspaper in Seoul, Korea, went across front page. It said their God was not able to save them. Oh, let me tell you, brothers and sisters, their God was Peter's God. And their faith was Peter's faith. But when Jesus was standing on the water, he said to Peter, come and spoke. Jesus did not yet speak a word for them to obey to come. They stepped out in faith, but not step out in his word, and not stepped out in his touch. Oh, the presumptuous, the presumptuous faith. And we've done it. We've done it. That's why when we believe, it's not enough to just believe. We still have to come and seek the Lord. We still have to draw near to him. We still need to just wait for his voice, wait for his touch. Let Jesus do it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, I love it. According to your faith. He touched them according to your faith. Their eyes were open. And then Jesus does something that's to us. It's kind of unusual. Look at the second part of verse 30 and 31. Read it with me. Jesus warned them sternly. See that no one knows about this, but they went out and spread the news about him all over the region. Okay. We get a little concerned about this, don't we? Isn't this just a little kind of what in the world is going on? Um, First of all, how in the world can they hide the fact that they were blind and now they see? Jesus wasn't telling them, uh, from now on, I want you to walk around with your sunglasses and your white canes. That's not what he's saying. You know what he's telling them? What he's telling them is he's telling them, I still want you to be careful about this proclamation of who I am. You know why? See, because the Jews were under the tyranny of Rome. And the Jews were not looking for a religious savior. The Jews were looking for a political Messiah. And the Bible tells us these guys disobeying the Lord, uh, the Lord's command to help, you know, actually it helped cause this snowball effect. And the scriptures tell us that because Jesus' miraculous works become so renowned, it tells us in, in, in John chapter 6, 14, 15, that the Jews try to make Jesus their king by force. And as a result, Jesus had to isolate himself for a season. It wasn't that Jesus, it wasn't that Jesus 
was saying hide the fact that you're he was saying there's a time and a place to make the proclamation of who I really am but there, there's a lesson in this and and here's the lesson you could have great faith and still disobey the Lord because faith is not about dis, dis, obey, obedience Jesus tells us what causes obedience in John 14 John 16 he said if you love me you'll obey Amen. these guys their, the eyes of their heart was open they had the faith to behold his greatness because of what Jesus did and then Jesus responded to it but they hadn't begun to follow him to fall in love with him they hadn't brothers and sisters just because you and I have faith doesn't make that some sort of a badge that we're spiritually mature for the word of God tells us that though I have faith that can move mountains if I have not love I am nothing it's about love that's why it says in Galatians again chapter 5 the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love Some of you have been facing some really difficult situations. And what you see in your natural eyes has really been concerning you. Some of you have fear. Some of you have worry. Some of you, you go to dark places. Some of you, you, you're just, you just kind of feel like you've kind of given up. You've given up. Brothers and sisters, the word pastor wants to share with you is this. Let Jesus restore the eyes of your heart with his faith. Amen. Instead of looking at that, instead of looking at what's making you so afraid, instead of looking at what's making you so upset, instead of looking at, at what's making you just give, throw in the towel and give up, oh, would you just allow him to open the, your eyes of your heart and see his greatness? Would you see the greatness that he is Jehovah, that he is God, that he is greater, that he can, he can, oh, yes, he can, and yes, he is bigger. Amen. Yes. I don't think my kid will ever come to the Lord. Would you stop that? Who are you? No, of course they won't. That's why it's a miracle of God. Amen. Come on. It's the truth. And the Bible says that God, the Bible already, already showed God's hand. Did it not? Oh, I would that they, they'd believe. I take no pleasure in, the, in, 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 in anyone perishing. Oh, I want them to come. So we already know God's heart in it. Would you let your eyes start of your faith expand to say, you know, God, you really do love them more than me. You really do want them safe more than me. See, you don't think God does. And God is infinite and his heart is forever. And he planned that child way, way before you ever had a twinkle in your eye and knew that that kid was coming and God said oh I have given a redeemer for him and I have it in my plans our problem is it's not happening soon enough but the problem with the problem with that is is that we're not God there is a process and God is being glorified would you just look at the greatness of the love of God for that child just look at the greatness of his love for you his love to make you the person, make you the husband, make you the wife that you're to be in that relationship. To make you the mom or the dad or the brother or the sister. Oh, yes, he can. Would you let your heart, the eyes of your heart, let him expand it with his faith. For when we see the greatness of Jesus, we give room for him to do great things Amen. in his name. Let's pray. First of all, Lord, sometimes I admit that I've replaced my emotional faith 
It comes from me with the faith that you author. And so then when I'm feeling down, I, I lose hope. Forgive me for that. For what you author, you perfect, Jesus. And you build. Some of us need to ask forgiveness for the, the presumption of our faith. Not waiting for your voice and for your touch, but just going out and just doing it. Some of us, Lord, need to ask forgiveness because, Jesus, we've only allowed a narrow vision of you. We've only allowed a vision of you that expands to the four Gospels, but not from cover to cover. Forgive us. Lord, we want to please Father God, and the only way to do it is with our faith. And I thank you for authoring and perfecting it. You are great. You are mighty. You are holy. You are God. You are Jehovah. You are Elohim. You are, you are Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah Shalom. You are, you are Jehovah Raha, hallelujah. Jehovah Testnu, you are, you are. Be lifted high in our hearts. More of you less of us and help us Lord to respond to you to come to you and to let you speak brothers and sisters that's why we have altar services sometimes that's why we come before the Lord in our devotion sometimes to let him speak to let him touch oh Jesus we love you we praise you stand would you please